Death mother symbolizes the behaviors and feelings of a woman who in some way threatens the life of her child. This is a continuum that makes up death mother, from infanticide at the extreme end of the range, to hostility, towards to neglect, to just not wanting this child, just feeling that this child is not good enough. What I'm going to do here is explore this dynamic within the framework of what it means to be a human being. I'm going to look at it from both the perspective of the mother and of the child. I'm going to focus on infanticide because it's the extreme end of the continuum. If we can understand that, we can get a sense of the whole continuum. But what I'll talk about is relevant across that whole continuum. It's also relevant to both mothers and children who've lived through adoption or through to mothers who can't be there because of illness, because of depression, because of social or religious circumstances. And that's because in the pre-modern time, if mum wasn't there for a very young child, that would have also threatened that child's life. It would have probably led to the death of a child. And a child doesn't know that mum's not there because mum can't be there or because mum doesn't want to be there because you're not the child that she wanted. The idea of infanticide of death mother is its extreme end is really dark. You know, most of us don't want to face it. We recoil from it. We think of women who commit these acts as mentally ill or as unnatural. We turn away. The idea that it's unnatural, however, is challenged by evolutionary biology and by anthropology. And we now know that although most mothers are deeply committed to most of their children most of the time, there are circumstances where a woman's going to be ambivalent about nurturing a particular child or indeed hostile to that child and that that's just as natural as being fully committed to the child and that it's been part of being human for as long as humans have existed. So what do we learn if we turn towards death mother and open to these perspectives? I'm going to argue that open to it can contribute to emotional healing, to therapeutic processes to change and to moving towards well-being. In particular, I'm going to argue that it can help two groups of people. Firstly, women who are living with the death mother energy in some form or another. Women who are living it tend to buy into the fact that they're unnatural, that there's something wrong with them for not being able to commit to their child. That, and that creates this sense of shame, this sense of fundamental inadequacy. And when we hold shame and we have those kind of beliefs, we can't turn inwards and face ourselves. We can't face what we're living. And if we can't do that, then we can't change. It also can help and make a contribution to those who've grown up in the shadow of a death mother. In the last 15 years, we've learned a lot about this we, and the trauma that it creates. It's sometimes called complex PTSD, sometimes developmental trauma but we know that it's incredibly damaging. Neurobiology has helped us heal the shame around it, how we behave because of those consequences. It's helped to hold us, to give us a scaffolding. I'm gonna suggest and hope to show how evolutionary and anthropological perspectives can add another layer of help. Healing, change, the work of therapy, if we're either a mother who's living the death mother energy or somebody who's grown up with it, is incredibly tough. It's tough both for the client who's trying to change and for the mental health professionals who are helping them. The understanding doesn't do that work for you, but the understanding presented here can help to provide a stronger framework, a container, which allows you to do that work. There's a caveat I need to put in at this point. Although I'm talking about death mother, fathers can play a significant role in infanticide and the decisions that lead to it, in hostility, in ambivalence. Indeed, kids can meet death mother in any of their caretakers. They can meet them in their religious teachers, in sports coaches, any adult or, or older person who has any kind of responsibility or say over that kid's life. You can meet a death mother, the energy of hostility. But I am going to talk about death mother because it's mostly mothers who've been pathologized for this. And also in terms of kind of the extremes of infanticide, that's mostly occurs very early in life. And although 
throughout human evolution, there have been a lot of people who have helped care for infants. Ultimately, it's still mothers who spend more time with the infants and young children than anyone else, and it's mothers who've tended to, to make those decisions. There's lots of research on this. It's a complex subject, it's incredibly sensitive. To do justice to Death Mother's story is an hour's talk. I'm going to now talk about Western perspectives towards Death Mother, including psychotherapist perspectives. In the middle two parts, I'm going to present the evolutionary and anthropological perspectives. And in the final part, I'm going to talk about the therapeutic value of these evolutionary and anthropological perspectives, expand on why I think it can help people. Western culture has idealised mother. In the West, there's the belief that it's instinctual, it's natural, it's automatic for mothers to love every child that they give birth to. And that the feelings and behaviours associated with death mother are seen as unnatural as wrong, as being against our biology. The denial of the shadow side, the denial of the fact that hostility and ambivalence and sometimes infanticide can be part of mothering in our society means that it's been, it doesn't get rid of that energy, but it means that we project it out onto other people, not us, it's these weird folks. So at times during history, it's been witches, it's been Jews, and it's been those possessed by Satan. In 19th century Britain, when it became clear that not all the women who were killing their babies, their young infants, were witches or possessed by Satan, the medical profession invented a mental illness um, called poor peril insanity. And the idea was that it was triggered either by birth or by breastfeeding. And it put mothers into this altered, mentally ill state. So, in this state, because they were mentally ill, because they were altered, they were behaving in a way that was unnatural and it allowed kind of infanticide to still be seen as something that wasn't part of humanity. It was something that came with illness that, that isn't what women should um, and naturally would live. We've got it in our fairy tales. Hansel and Gretel, the original Grimm's version in 1812, it was the mother who took the kids, who suggested to the father and wanted to abandon the kids in the forest when they were running low of food. By the fourth edition in 1840, the mother had been changed to stepmother, presumably because the sensibilities of the time just couldn't handle that it might be a mother who abandoned her children to die, even if they were all at risk of starvation. Psychodynamic psychotherapists are people who look at what we hold under the surface in the unconscious. So you might think that they would get to the shadow side of what we hold, but certainly the early psychodynamic therapists failed to recognise death mother. So Freud, who was of course central to this whole way of thinking, built a lot of his ideas around the story of Oedipus. But what he doesn't mention in a single place is that the story of Oedipus begins when his parents send him out to be left on a hillside to die. So the actual first act of the Oedipus story is leaving a child to die. Now a shepherd picks him up and he doesn't die, but that's what initiates it. In the 1930s, a psychoanalyst in the Freudian tradition called Alice Balent wrote these words. For all of us, it remains self evident that the interests of the mother and child are identical and it is a generally acknowledged measure of the goodness or badness of the mother how far she feels this identity of interest right so if you don't if you're not unconditionally completely identified with your child you're a bad mother now i know that the quote people say the quote comes in a different context and actually that's to take it out of context isn't fair, but it is taken out of context and it's, though it's from the 1930s, it is still circulated on social media. So it pops up on my Facebook page, it pops up on Twitter from time to time. It's still, this is still how a lot of people think, as kind of indicated by how much this quote still goes round. <laughs> 
More recently, really starting in the 70s, some psychodynamic therapists have looked at maternal hostility and ambivalence in, in quite a lot of depth. They include Dorothy Block, Rositska Parker, Brett Carr. The Jungian Marion Woodman also did a lot of work on this, and it was, it was Marion Woodman who coined the term death mother, and from, I did a lot of work with Marion, and it is from Marion Woodman that I, I've got this term. When these, all of these psychodynamic therapists have looked at death mother, however, they see it pretty much solely as something that's gone wrong in a woman's psyche. So something wrong in her mind. So maybe she wasn't mothered and so she doesn't know how to mother. She doesn't have a template. She didn't learn how to do that. Maybe she grew up in a difficult household where she couldn't be vulnerable and so she fought her own vulnerability and, and put it to one side and tried to bury it. And then suddenly she has this baby and it's vulnerable and that reminds her of her own vulnerability and she can't face it. She doesn't want to deal with it so she wants to get rid of the baby. Some have suggested that's one reason behind infanticide. Sometimes, you know, a woman will have grown up in a household, in a family, in a religious setting, in a culture, in a time of history, where she couldn't live her own life. It was too constrained, there were too many blocks on. And suddenly she sees this baby and it's got all this aliveness and potential. And it brings up incredible grief at what she's been unable to live. And she doesn't want to face that. Sometimes people lose a child and when they lose a child, they think that they'll get over the grief, that the pain will go away if they have another child. So they have a child fairly soon afterwards as a replacement. But you're never going to heal that kind of grief and a later child is never going to make up for the child that you lost. It's never, and if you're expecting it to do so, then you're going to look at this child as though it's not good enough. And so there's a kind of death mother energy that comes through that. And then that we hear about from the press, you know, either a mother or a father might kill the children after a marriage breaks up in order to punish and hurt their partner. The idea that this problem comes from within the mind fits with the Western view that to be a natural mother is instinctive that it comes from inside of us, that it's to do with our fundamental biology and our physiology. And there is a truth to that. Pregnancy and birth do lead to the change in hormones. They do lead to a change in, in a woman's neurobiology and that does predispose her to bonding with her children. Also, many of the internal psychological factors that the therapists have, have talked about are real and valid and come into play. But external, physical, cultural, social environment, all those factors are equally important. And that's a key message I really want to get across, is that mothering isn't just a response to what's happening inside. Mothering is hugely influenced by the environment in which a woman is living, her social environment, her emotional environment, her economic environment, her pol political environment, the physical environment. And the, that environment, is, as I'll argue later, is crucial in, in constellating and activating the death mother energy. A revealing perspective to look at that external environment is evolution. That may surprise some people because the kind of popular view is that if you talk about evolution, you're talking about something being genetically determined. Nothing could be farther from the truth. In the last 50 years, biologists who study behaviour of all sorts, from you know, the smallest creature and plants to humans, biologists who study behaviour from an evolutionary perspective have shown us that behaviour has evolved to be influenced by the physical and social environment in which a creature finds itself. You know, creatures are living in all kinds of different environments, and if it was genetically determined that they behave this way, and they're in a different environment, then it's you know, very unadaptive. It's much more adaptive to, for evolution to have produced creatures that can change their behaviour in accordance with the environment in which they find themselves. That goes for humans, of course, as much as for any other animal. And it 
also goes for the realm of mothering. So evolution shaped mothers of the human species and of other species to alter how they respond to their children, depending on the external environment in which they find themselves. And I'm going to explore that in the next two parts of this. So the first person to look at mothering within the framework of evolution was John Bowlby, who was a British psychiatrist, a psychologist and a psychoanalyst. And in the 1960s, he founded attachment theory. He came from a Freudian tradition, but he got very interested and excited by the work that was being done in ethology, in animal behaviour, and really thought that we needed to bring that to humans to understand human behaviour. At the time of the 1960, ethology was, it was a pretty new subject, and so people were looking at the typical behaviour of a species. They wanted to know what did gorillas do differently from chimpanzees, and how did zebras behave differently from buffalo. So they were looking at kind of big picture, what are the big patterns of behaviour that kind of identified and were distinct to different species. And John Bowlby brought that approach to mothering. So he kind of looked at mothering as this kind of one behaviour. And he said, for babies to love mothers and mothers to love babies is taken for granted as intrinsic to human nature. So again, another person for, the bio, for whom that biology, instinctively unconditional love, is intrinsic to human nature. And that was as much as we knew of the biology at the time. But in the 1970s, there was a revolution in evolutionary thinking. And also because of the fieldwork, people were doing much longer studies on these creatures in the wild, on non-human animals in the wild. And what people discovered was that for many, many species, they evolved a range of different behaviours and responses, both in terms of physiology and in terms of behaviour that they could sort of pick and choose from depending on their environment. Obviously, none of this is conscious, but that animals, there wasn't one way to behave that characterised a particular species. That for every single species, there's a range of ways to carry out certain of the challenges of life. So think about cars. All cars are there to get us from A to B faster than we can walk. But a car that's suited to going down a newly tarmac motorway is going to be of absolutely no use when you're bashing across a bush in Tanzania, there's no roads, there's lots of aardvark holes, there's mud, there's grass. You need, you know, in that environment, you need a four-wheel drive. And a four-wheel drive that's going to get you round a bush area is going to be of no use in the Arctic because actually anything with wheels in the Arctic on snow isn't going to work. There you need a snowmobile, something that's built on skis. So you've got these different variants of cars depending on the environment which you're trying to navigate. And it's the same for behaviour, including mothering. You've got different variants of mothering depending on the environment, the emotional, social and physical environment that a mother and her family is trying to navigate. The person who really brought this to our attention was Sarah Blaffer Hurdy in the 1990s. Hurdy is a primatologist, an anthropologist, an evolutionary biologist and a feminist. And she wrote two paradigm changing books in which she argues that mothering is not synonymous with unconditional love. That among many species, primates, humans and many other species as well, there's been flexibility built into how a female mothers her young and that anything from full commitment to ambivalence to abandonment and infanticide are all part of a natural range of behaviours. It's easy to see why evolution might have produced an emotional system in which females are fully committed and love their infants. After all, evolution is about the survival of descendants. It's harder to see why evolution might have produced an emotional system where females might be infanticidal, hostile, ambivalent, neglectful of their infants. What we need to think about and begin to conceptualise is that 
We are the descendants of mothers who raised at least one surviving offspring to the age where that child could reproduce themselves. And in the environment in which we evolved, it was really hard to keep children alive. So in traditional societies today, between 30 and 50% of those children born die before they're 15 years old. We know that the figures were as similar, if not higher, for our ancestors. And when that greater percent, when up to half the children born are going to die before adulthood, that's what it's been throughout most of human history. Mothers have had to make choices. Are they going to nurture this child or not? And they have to take into account various factors when making those choices. They have to take into account factors in their external condition. That decision isn't always conscious. Sometimes it can be done through unconscious channels. Um, but all the same, that is part of what has gone on. That's part of what's made up mothering. And I'm now going to start to talk about these various factors that have influenced human mothers through the millennium. The first is the resources available to her. It takes resources to raise a child. It takes calories that were hard to come by in many environments in which we've lived throughout evolutionary history. It takes time, it takes care, it takes emotions. Women have had to assess in some way or another, again, sometimes consciously, sometimes not, whether they have enough resources to keep this child alive. And if they give resources to this child, what's the effect going to be on other children? One way that's helpful to think about this is about birth spacing in societies where there's no birth control and where there's no milk substitutes, there's no formula, so young infants have to breastfeed. And a lot of work was done in the 60s, 70s, 80s on the Kung hunter-gatherers um, from the Kalahari. The Kung are a modern people, but their lifestyle is similar to that of some of our ancestors. And men generally do the hunting and women generally do the gathering. When women gather, they can be walking five or six hours to go out and collect tubers and nuts and berries. And when they go out, they'll carry any breastfeeding children with them and they breastfeed children till they're four and a half years old on average. So imagine yourself as a Kung woman. You've got a two-year-old, two and a half-year-old, and you've just given birth to a newborn. What do you do? If you wean the two-year-old, it's going to die. You need to be breastfeeding it for another two years. If you try to keep the two-year-old and the newborn, you're going to be walking five or six hours carrying these two infants and then also carrying the nuts and the tubers. That's going to be almost impossible to do. So do you, you know, not care for the newborn that you've just given birth to? Kung women unusually give birth in the bush, away from home. And if they were put in this position, they generally never picked up the infant, they just left it in the bush. And when Kung lived traditionally, more traditional lives, an anthropologist started working with them in the 60s and 70s, one in a hundred infants was abandoned at birth to die. There's an anthropologist called Marjorie Shostak, who's, who sadly died many years ago, but she worked with a Kung woman called Nisa to record the story of Nisa's life. So she got Nisa to tell stories of her life and then she translated them. And these are Nisa's words about what happened when she was a four-year-old, four-and-a-half-year-old child, I think, and her baby brother was born after her. After he was born, he lay there crying. I greeted him. My baby brother, I have a little brother. Someday we'll play together. But my mother said, what do you think this thing is? Why are you talking to it like that? Now get up and go back to the village and bring me my digging stick. I said, what are you going to dig? And she said, a hole. I'm going to dig a hole so I can bury the baby. The new Nisa will be able to nurse again. You are much too thin. Infanticide in the Kung 
abandoning these newborns at birth, there was always regret, but it was culturally sanctioned. And it was sanctioned in nearly every other hunter-gatherer society that we know of. It's been a similar story for twins as well among many hunter-gatherers. A woman simply can't breastfeed two infants at the same time and go out and collect and gather food for other children that she may have. So, you know, it's been couched in terms of twins being a bad omen or being bad luck, or, but generally one or both of twins have often been abandoned at birth. The resources that a mother has to take into account aren't just milk, it's not just about breastfeeding, it can be about how much food you have more generally. So between the 17th and 19th centuries in Britain and indeed in most of Europe, impoverished families would commit infanticide. Sometimes they'd just roll over the baby during the night or they'd just neglect it and it would die of neglect. It wouldn't necessarily be overt infanticide. But the challenge was that if they kept this baby and it grew up, the household resources would just end up spread too thinly. You wouldn't have enough food to feed everybody and then all the children would be at risk. This is an image from 1840 of a Russian mother who is literally throwing her baby out of a sled to the wolves. You know, it's been part of pre-modern European behaviour um, as well. Japan in the 18th and 19th centuries, there was considerable records and documentation of infanticide. And the term that was used in Japan was mabiki, which is, an agri I'm sure I pronounced it wrong, but that's how it's written in English. Um, and that's an agricultural term, which means to thin out densely planted seedlings so that the remaining plants have enough light and space to thrive. Again, you want to, you know, you have too many seedlings taking the resources, none of them are gonna thrive. This is a screen print from 1826. It's on the front of a book about this subject and it's, you can see a woman crushing her newborn. Although it's mainly been infants who are at risk, it's not always infants. So imagine that you're a mother living in a traditional society. You've got several children, the rains fail and there starts to be a famine. So you've got much less food than you normally have. If you, what do you do with that food? If you share it equally between four or five children, they're all going to end up severely malnourished and they're all likely to die. But if you favour one or two children, then you're going to increase the odds that at least some of them will survive. These decisions are rarely conscious. You might just think, well, she's a better eater than he is, or He's doing the herding, so he needs more energy. I mean, or it may just be that, you know, different amounts find themselves in the bowl without you consciously deciding one way or other. It's not necessarily that women have been making these decisions consciously, but these decisions have been made in our evolutionary past and in the more recent past too, in pre-modern times. And the reality is that we are all descended from women who did whatever was necessary to keep some children alive. Women who acted fairly, who divided up their resources fairly between all their children, were at risk of losing all their children, and they didn't leave descendants. So how relevant is this today? How relevant is it to understanding trauma, to emotional well-being? It's very hard for most of us to think of food shortages, most of us in the West to think of food shortages. But in the UK in 2014, there were half a million children in what are considered to be food poor households, children who weren't getting enough food. In the USA in 2016, there were considered to be 13 million children. Now, in our societies, that's not going to lead to death but it will have an impact on health. It'll have an impact on long-term health as well, on how you age. It'll also have an impact on how well you can do at school. If you're not well nourished, concentration and ability to do at school is impaired. So it is going to have an impact on life chances. Um, even, in our, even in our societies today, though it doesn't, it's not gonna mean death. And I think even in households where, that are wealthy, have never experienced food poverty, 
where kids are never going to be hungry. A child's psyche is still going to be sensitive to feeling that they're an unfavoured child. Because if you get a sense that you are, you know, your parents prefer X or Y, the other children, for nearly all the times that human have existed, to be a less favoured child would have been life-threatening if hard times hit. And so the kind of competition between siblings and feeling that you're not favoured is, I think, genuinely terrifying for a child, even in a very wealthy household, because we have generations and generations, hundreds of thousands of years, where that would have been life-threatening. The fact it's not today doesn't really isn't very relevant in terms of those emotions. It's the same thing if uh, you've been bullied and your parents or your teachers have allowed you to be bullied by a sibling, by your classmates, because the message is that you are not worth protecting. Push comes to shove, doesn't matter if you're hurt, if you're killed. So again, a bullied child isn't just suffering from being bullied, they're suffering because Nobody has protected them, which tells them that nobody really cares about them that much. The second factor that Herdy brought to our attention in terms of affecting mothering was the support that a woman has. So the first factor was the resources in terms of calories. The second factor is how much support she has around her. Human children are not independent when they're weaned. You have to keep feeding them. You have to, adults have to keep providing food for them. In hunter-gatherer societies, depending on the environment in which they are, kids don't become independent don't, in terms of food till anywhere between the ages of 15 and 20. So you've got all those years between a child being weaned and a child being able to provide its own food. That is not true of the other apes, of gorillas, chimpanzees, or of the other primates. Once an infant is weaned, it finds its own food. But with humans, that isn't the case. And what it means is that mothers are responsible for helping to care for and find food for several children at once. So there could be a 14-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, you know, and a 4-year-old, all of whom the mum has to be helping to get food for. That's incredibly challenging and it's practically probably been impossible for one woman to do by herself. Human mothers have needed help in order to raise their children. That helps come from a variety of people. It's come from fathers, certainly, but you can't rely on any one person, be it a father or anyone else in our evolutionary history, because death rates of adults were really high. So if it's just the father and he dies, then you're absolutely stuffed as, as a woman. Um, so what's evolved is a system where there have been multiple caregivers, where mums have drawn on a lot of people for support and for help in raising their children. A woman who's already got teenage children, they might help doing the childcare when mum goes out gathering, or they might do some gathering themselves, but they will help, husbands will help. Grannies have been absolutely vitally important. A mother's mother, if, if a woman has her mother there when she gives birth, that has made a profound difference throughout our, our evolutionary history. In this photograph, you see a Hadza mother. The Hadza are hunter-gatherers that live in Tanzania. And you see a Hadza mother handing her very small infant over to her own mother. She's about to go out gathering. She's going to leave mum to look after the infant. Research in the Gambia showed that with women who are having their first and second child, if their own mother was there to support them through that process, it halved the rate of child mortality. So the normal rate of child mortality for first and second children was around 40%. If a woman's own mother was there to help and support her, then the child mortality rate dropped to 20%. That's a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to have this support. And Sarah Hurdy argues that because this support has been so vital to human mothers throughout our evolutionary history, women who don't have this support are likely to be ambivalent and reticent about caring for a child because there's a very good chance that that child was going to die, that their caring would come to nothing. And so this probably wasn't a good time 
a good child to invest in. Again, we see echoes of this today, albeit muted and titrated by modern life, but it is there. So young, first-time mothers who've got a husband, or if they're single women, whose own mother lives nearby, or even who have support from a community and a social worker, are more nurturing and more committed, and they form stronger bonds with their infants than young mothers that don't have any kind of support network. And that can be measured, and that then goes through the child's life, that initial how the mother feels about the child. You can see the echoes of that going through the mother-child relationship. So to summarise this part, there is no one way of being a natural human mother. We as humans evolved a range of emotional responses, a range of physiological and behavioural responses to match the range of environments in which women have found themselves in. In this part, I've explored the availability of food and of support, how that affects mothering. How mothers who are struggling to get enough food, who have little support, are much more likely to feel hostile or ambivalent, how they're much more likely to express and live the death mother's energy. And I've talked about how we see the echoes of that today. In the next part, we're going to look at the third factor, which is the child itself and its characteristics, and how that then affects a mother's response to it. We all know that the sex of an infant, the sex of a child, can make an enormous difference to how mother and father feels about the child. You know, we often hear about how boys are favoured, the one-child policy in China where so many girls were being aborted. Um, in some societies, girls are favoured, but generally we hear about girls not being wanted and, and hostility towards girls. There's an article that I wrote that this talk has come out of, and I elaborate on that in the article. I'm not going to go into it here. A child's temperament can also make a difference. A child that's very passive and quiet is probably not going to elicit a lot of care from a parent. A child that's very difficult, um, that seems to be very demanding, that's very hard to soothe, might well elicit hostility. But what I'm actually going to focus on here more is on the robustness and the health of the child. Because that certainly evolutionarily has been profoundly important to how a mother's feelings and behaviour have unfolded. Remember that throughout most of evolutionary history, between 30 and 50% of human children did not survive. And when death rates are that high, it made very little sense for women to commit to children who were unlikely to make it, children who weren't robust, children in poor health. And for our ancestors, and indeed for many women living in harsh environments today, premature, ill, disabled, sickly, weak children were killed, or they were more often just left to die of neglect. The first and, and most layered and intricate study of this was, is by a social anthropologist called Nancy Sheffer Hughes, who worked with women living in shanty towns in Brazil. And she brings together many layers of history, of poverty, of politics, of economics, to weave this very intricate and complex system. But the bottom line is that for these women, weak and ill infants were often left to die of neglect. The, the women did not see themselves as killing their infants. They'd say, you know, well, this child never wanted, you know, never took the bottle. This child doesn't like eating. This, this infant doesn't want to grab hold of life. But effectively, they weren't given milk, they weren't given water. And so they died of what Sheffy Hughes calls passive infanticide through neglect. And she argues that the image of the all-nurturing mother, the all-giving mother, is a modern artefact. It's a Western artefact, and it really can only exist in societies and cultures where women can trust that 
practically all their children are going to survive. In harsher environments where there were high child death rates, women just didn't have that emotional luxury. They, cultural, social environment just didn't allow that. Aaron Denham did a study, another social anthropologist, did a study more recently in the Nankani in northern Ghana. And again, there are a medley of factors that lead to child death, including disease and poverty, political, religious systems, healthcare availability. But some disabled and ailing children are deemed to be spirit children and they're poisoned. These children aren't seen as being possessed as spirits. They're seen as spirits who have taken on a human form and infiltrated a human family, a bit like a cuckoo, with the aim of causing mischief and harm. Among the Nankani, fathers have a big role in the decisions. Deciding whether a child is a spirit child or not involves going to diviners, and fathers are crucial in that whole process. But the diviners and then the concoction men who do poison children who are deemed to be spirit children are actually seen as people who save life, not as killers. Because they're, they're getting the, rid of the spirits, they're not killing a human. And Denim argues that actually there's a truth to that because in this environment where diseases and poverty are so high, if you try to keep these sickly, weak children alive, they take so much care and so much resources that other children would be at risk. They wouldn't be enough to go around to other children and so you'd get the death of other children. In Mali, in West Africa again, children who are developmentally delayed are again seen as spirit children and this time rather than being poisoned they're just left out in the bush and the belief is that they turn into snakes um, which is, snakes are believed to be spirits in some form, they turn back into snakes. And people have said, you know, sometimes when I see a snake, I wonder if this used to be my child. Now, this sounds really far-fetched to us, but actually in Britain, Ireland, France, Germany, Sweden, I mean, most of Europe, between 1300s and 1800s, we had an almost identical belief, and that was the belief in changelings. So the idea was that fairies and elves and goblins, our form of spirits, if you like, would from time to time come and kidnap a newborn human baby and they would put one of their children in its place. Often the children who were deemed to be changelings were children who were ill, who were developmentally delayed, who were physically disabled. Sometimes once a child got polio, it was deemed to be a changeling. And the behaviour around changelings was the same as the behaviour in West Africa. The kids were taken out into the forest, into, you know, cold northern forests, for the spirit to reclaim them. This was an elf child, they were left out for the elves and the fairies and the goblins to reclaim. This is a 1907 image, a watercolour, of Cupid leading a child with polio out into the forests. What's its relevance today? Well, we do see its shadow, very sadly. So children with congenital abnormalities are two to four times more likely to end up in hospital from parental abuse than children that don't have those issues. Only last week I heard a radio programme about how they're going to have to create a whole legal system around surrogacy because there have now been some cases where a couple have asked a woman to carry a child for them and then the child that they've had that this woman has had has had some kind of abnormality some kind of disability and the couple who originally wanted the child saying we're not going to take it now we don't want this child and the woman never thought she was going to raise a child she was you know doing them a favor raising you know carrying a child for them and so it's it's becoming a, an issue that people are saying we're going to have to address now Janet Mann is a psychologist who did a preliminary study in the 90s with twins, looking at preterm twins. And she looked at when these twins came home, they had been in you know, incubators and hospital for a long time, but when they finally came home, how mums responded to them. And what she found was that she looked at seven pairs of twins, 
And what she found was that every one of those mothers, all seven mothers, paid more attention to the healthier twin, although they absolutely swore that they weren't. They swore that they were treating both twins equally. And they genuinely believed that. I mean, they weren't, they were unaware that they were paying more attention to the healthier twin, but something in them unconsciously was giving more care to the child that seemed more robust, more healthy, more likely to make it. So to sum up the evolutionary and the anthropological section, the belief that biology programs mothers for unconditional love is a fantasy. Throughout most of human history, death mother has been part of life. Ancestral mothers have raised children in a range of circumstances, and we've evolved a range of emotions to cope with that, to match that. And infanticide, death mother is at one end of that range. Death mother can be thought of as a medley of conscious and unconscious feelings and behaviour that wax and wane depending on the circumstances. So a woman can lovingly nurture a strong and healthy child and that same woman can fatally neglect one who is weak or ill. A mother can be fiercely committed to an infant who's born after a sibling's been weaned, but she can neglect or kill or just not pick up one whose birth is going to jeopardise the life of a still nursing toddler. In good times when a woman's got plentiful food, lots of support, death mother has little place in women's lives. However, when the times are tough, death mother is going to emerge to colour an emotional palette. It's genuinely hard for us to take this on board. That's partly because of our fear of it, we don't want to face it. It's also partly because we live in unprecedented times. We have birth control, we could decide on the spacing of our children. Most of us have plentiful food. We all have relatively clean water. We have antibiotics, we have vaccinations, we have other forms of medical care. Mercifully, few of us have experienced the death of the child. It was different for our ancestors. Child death was not out of the ordinary. Nearly every parent will have lost at least one child and often more. And practically every child when growing up will have experienced the death of a sibling, of a cousin or one of its friends. In my 20s, I did anthropological research in Tanzania and one of the things that I did was I looked at the number of children that women have had and did kind of their life histories, recorded it as part of the research that I was doing. And I've sat with women who have given, they were very traditional living people in a wilderness area of Tanzania. And I've sat with women who have had 12 live births and who don't have a single surviving child. You know, when you've got 50% of your children dying before they're 15, that's going to leave some women with no surviving children at all. And that has been how it's been for most of human history. The state we have now is very new and very unusual. For most of the time that humans have existed, the death of a child from one cause have been, or another has been part of life. And that painful reality lives on in us. It lives on in our body and psyche, even if it's not today's reality. But it was there for so much of our existence. It's woven into the fabric of who we are. The fact that maternal ambivalence and hostility has been part of our evolutionary history doesn't mean it's desirable or that we're destined to live it. Because something was this way in the past, doesn't mean it should be this way in the present. That's called the naturalistic fallacy when you say, well, this is how it was in the past, this is how it was throughout human evolution, this is what we should do now. We need to have discretion when looking at the past, when looking at our evolution and seeing whether aspects of it would make a difference to today's well-being. So certainly adapting some aspects of how life was in the past would make a difference. Less sugar, more exercise, probably carrying babies skin to skin, breastfeeding we know makes some difference, having a lot for women, having a lot of support around them. There are many things that could enhance the present. 
But there's aspects of the past that are not going to. I mean, nobody in their right mind would suggest that we should go back to a time, natural time, when child mortality rates were between 30 and 50 percent. But to, to bring child mortality rates down from that, we had to understand diseases, we had to understand hygiene, we had to get beneath what was causing all that in order to make a difference to that. And it seems to me that understanding a mother's ambivalence and understanding what underlies infanticide can also help us to best work with it, to change it so that it's not being expressed and lived in the present time. So in the final part, I'm going to explore and expand on how this understanding, how an evolutionary and anthropological consciousness can help both women and indeed men who are living aspects of the death mother energy and those who grew up with a death mother of some kind. How can evolutionary and anthropological understanding contribute to healing, to change and to well-being? In this, the fourth and final part, I'm going to explore how that knowledge, the knowledge that comes from evolution and from anthropology, how can it contribute to healing and to change? How does it make a difference to the emotional suffering that we experience in a modern world? Obviously, the evolution and the anthropology, what we've learnt from it, has implications for politics, for economics. But that isn't my area of expertise. My area of expertise is in personal change, in psychotherapy and in emotional healing. So that's what I'm going to focus on here. Knowledge, consciousness is not enough in and of itself to bring about change and healing. We have to go inside ourselves and feel what we carry from inside and we have to be able to face it and then take steps to change. It's scary and it's challenging. Knowledge won't do that for us, but knowledge can help to hold us as we do that. It can help to give us a framework, it can help to give us a container where we can steady ourselves as we go through that process. There's been a lot of work done on the neurobiology of mothering and of infants, and the parts of that work that have filtered through to psychotherapy have helped a lot of people, a lot of us hold ourselves as we go inside ourselves to explore what we carry. I'm going to argue here that the work from evolution, from anthropology, that the research that I've talked about in the middle two parts can make a parallel contribution. I'm going to start with, I think, the fact it can make a big difference to women who are struggling to love their children, to women who've had to let go of their children to adoption or for whatever reason. The way that we've idealised mothering in the West means that we see such women as abnormal and less than human. And actually, the women who've had to do this see themselves in that framework too. They take on that cultural belief. And that leads to what we call shame, this kind of abiding, visceral, insidious conviction of being fundamentally inadequate. Living with shame is intolerable. And there's an impetus then to get rid of whatever's causing shame. So, you know, I'm, inad I'm fundamentally inadequate. I'm not a real human being. I'm less than human. OK, well, if I can get rid of whatever's triggering that, th then it'll be better. So. If you're feeling that way because of how you're mothering, the impetus is going to be to want to get rid of the child. That's going to lead to more hostility, more ambivalence towards the child and create a vicious spiral. Psychoanalyst Rosicka Parker, who wrote a book called Mother Love, Mother Hate, interviewed a woman who just encapsulated these feelings. So I'm just going to read this woman's quotes. I can remember hurling the baby down on the pillow once and just screaming and not caring. I wanted to kill him, really. I think it was to do with being so tormented, worried and guilty. You know, the anxiety and guilt feeling I was getting it all wrong and that I was bad and useless. 
I just wanted to get away from the situation. I felt unable to tolerate it. So when we idealise mums, any mum who isn't living that ideal is going to feel bad and useless and want to get away from the situation. And that's going to create hostility towards the child. This isn't just a kind of American Western phenomena. There were psychologists called Lou Marie Kruger and Marlene Lorenz who worked in a rural, semi-low income, in a semi-rural, low income South African community. And women there had bought into the same beliefs about mothering. And those beliefs, and they were caught in the same shame-fueled spirals. I mean, these, these psychologists actually talk about these women experiencing shame. So they thought that a good mother was ever giving, ever providing, but they were in poverty and they couldn't get enough food to, for their kids. And so when their kids came complaining of hunger, it would hit the mother's shame and guilt. And women responded in a couple of ways. Some women were actually violent to their children, trying to just shut them up. And other women would sit there and say, I wish you'd never been born. We know that the long-term effects of that on children and on mothers are just, you know, create incredible suffering. And so being caught in this idealised version of mother just creates these spirals. Additionally, when mothers are caught in shame, when anybody is caught in shame, we can't face ourselves. We don't want to look in and see whether we're so inadequate. And at that point, you become alienated from yourself. And you're also going to become alienated from children if that's what's, what's creating it, if that's what the trigger is for it. There can be no change and no healing when you're that alienated from yourself. All you're going to do is create continuing cycles of suffering. As Carl Jung famously said, we cannot change anything unless we accept it. Condemnation does not liberate, it oppresses. An evolutionary consciousness, an anthropological consciousness, given through psychoeducation, can get away from condemnation. It can allow us to accept, to find compassion. Maybe as a mother we're struggling with a young toddler and we've given birth to a newborn. Maybe we've got twins, maybe we've got a child who's ill or a child who's disabled. Maybe we have fallen on tough times, maybe economically tough times, maybe the relationship's in difficulty, maybe our own health is bad, maybe we've lost support. Today our children will survive, but in the past they wouldn't have done that and our ambivalence and hostility is going to reflect that. And so if we can understand that we're following patterns that are hundreds of thousands of years old, patterns that allowed our ancestors to survive in these kind of circumstances, it helps mothers to change the context of how they see themselves. Instead of seeing themselves as defective, unnatural, not a real human being, they could start to see themselves as human. They're following these ancient human patterns. And once you start seeing yourself in that framework, you can let go of the belief of, I'm fundamentally inadequate. You can start to dismantle the shame. And that's not an excuse for staying on the path of death mother, for continuing to behave in this way towards your children. But it does open the door to creating compassion and to creating understanding. And that then allows you to look inwards and to honestly own your feelings and your behaviour. And that is what opens the door to change. There's a parallel dynamic that goes for those who've grown up under the shadow of a death mother. So we now know that if you grow up with a hostile, hostile mum, with a mum who's ambivalent or who's indifferent, it leads to trauma, sometimes called complex PTSD, sometimes called developmental trauma sometimes called attachment trauma. There's a range of names, but we know that there's significant psychological and indeed physical embodied effects of growing up, knowing that you weren't wanted, that there's hostility. Clinicians are very aware of this. 
The general public is less so because what's been focused on in the public sphere is much more overt sexual and physical abuse. So people who've grown up feeling that they weren't wanted don't see that as causing trauma. And then if they're behaving in ways or their feelings are out of control in certain ways, they don't see the kind of underlying traumatic roots of that. They believe that their behaviour must be due to their own inadequacy. I mean, they weren't physically or sexually abused, so there's no reason why they should be behaving this way. It must be that there's something fundamentally wrong with who I am. And that creates an own kind of silo of shame. And because the source is hidden, because you don't see the cause of that childhood trauma, you get imprisoned in this way of being, in this shame. You get imprisoned in what I call a trauma world, which is the subject of another talk that I've posted on here. An evolutionary consciousness can help us work our way out of this prison. For our ancestors, any hint of death mother any hint of being a less favoured child meant mortal danger. It was a concrete threat to survival for most of the time that human beings have existed. And that, so there's a deeply embodied fear that children carry of that, that goes back generations and generations. Children have evolved to be incredibly sensitive to any sign of maternal ambivalence, let alone to hostility or possible infanticide. And when that fear gets triggered, a whole load of systems get triggered around that, that then create what we understand as trauma. You know, an infant can't know it's been born in the West in 2019 in a nice hospital and that the old patterns are no longer relevant. It can't know that child mortality is no longer 30 to 50 percent. A tiny infant has no way of knowing that. And so these old systems are going to be mobilised if you feel in any way unwanted. And once we start to understand that, again, it changes the context. For somebody who's struggling with that, struggling with the after effects of that or the long-term effects of that, it can change the context in which we see ourselves. So we're behaving like this, not because of our inadequacy, but as a response to what throughout 99.99999% of human evolution would have actually meant death. And understanding that can alleviate shame and it can open the door to self-acceptance, to self-compassion, and that's healing in and of itself. And it's also a vital step in opening the doors to change. So to conclude, a modern evolutionary understanding of mothering adds to the rich body of knowledge that we already have. It brings insight, it brings heart. It highlights the misconception of equating sensitive and committed mothering with natural mothering and insensitive and hostile mothering with unnatural mothering. It takes the debate away from natural versus unnatural. It depathologizes it. It also tells us that we each carry within us an anciently embodied unconscious knowledge of how hard it was for ancestral mothers to raise surviving children and that the dynamics of mothering have been far more precarious, nuanced and complex than popular culture would suggest. It also tells us, you know, it also gives us a sense of how we all carry an anciently embodied unconscious knowledge of how precarious life was for human infants during our evolutionary history and the profound fear that infants and children carry because of that. We're understandably reluctant to open to this knowledge. It triggers deeply embodied ancient terrors. Yet when we do open to it, when we allow it into our minds and into our bodies, we discover that an evolutionary consciousness frees us to understand our experience as an expression of our shared humanity and not as a sign of some intrinsic and personal inadequacy of our own. So to conclude, listening to Death Mother's story 
and understanding the death mother feelings and behaviours as an aspect of our evolved humanity means that we stop seeing ourselves and other people through judgmental, dehumanising and shaming eyes. It allows us to bring compassion to others and self-compassion to ourselves. And that is healing in and of itself. That also frees us to go inside ourselves and to feel our way into what we carry in our own minds and our own bodies and to face that and to open that with to open to that with honesty. And being able to face and open to what we carry in ourselves is what brings about lasting and meaningful change.